Hello everyone, this is Eric Strong from Stanford, and today I'll be talking about syncope. After watching this video, you'll be able to define syncope and describe its features. You'll be able to describe the three major categories of syncope, to list several etiologies within each category, to be able to identify the most likely mechanism in a patient presenting with syncope, and last, to choose a cost-effective diagnostic strategy. So to start us off, what is syncope? Most healthcare professionals simply think of syncope as the medical term for passing out, and it is essentially that. All of you have probably witnessed someone fainting before, and many of you have experienced it yourself. Specifically, there are four typical features of a syncopal episode. There is abrupt loss of consciousness. It's accompanied by a loss of postural tone. It's of short duration and recovery is spontaneous. Some references also include a fifth feature in that the mechanism must involve global cerebral hypoperfusion. Syncope is frequently, but not always, immediately preceded by a very brief collection of symptoms known as a prodrome. This prodrome may include lightheadedness, nausea, diaphoresis, and visual disturbances, and they may last several seconds to several minutes. As a very general rule, syncope that occurs without a prodrome is more likely to be cardiogenic in origin and thus more serious. There's an event called presyncope, which is the situation in which a syncopal prodrome occurs but is not followed by an actual loss of consciousness. This may be because whatever hemodynamic perturbation that was about to trigger the syncope was self-limited, such as a brief arrhythmia like a sinus pause, or it might be because the affected patient did something in response to the presyncopal symptoms which prevented their progression. For example, when someone feels lightheaded and they respond by lying down. The etiologies of syncope have varied systems of categorization. The one which feels the most logical to me is to consider three broad categories, reflex syncope, cardiogenic syncope, and orthostatic syncope. I'll talk about each one at a time. Reflex syncope is a diverse collection of etiologies in which syncope occurs as a result of a dysfunctional response of the autonomic nervous system to a normal stimuli. There's incomplete understanding of the pathophysiology of reflex syncope, with different clinical subtypes appearing to have different mechanisms, but even patients with the same clinical subtype may display different physiologic changes at different times. There are three of these clinical subtypes. First, what is commonly known as vasovagal syncope, but occasionally as neurocardiogenic syncope. Vasovagal syncope can be triggered by emotional stress, for example, when a person passes out upon hearing bad news, it can also be triggered by prolonged standing, as might occur during a school performance or during a long wedding. When a patient syncopizes during the process of having their blood drawn, this is also vasovagal syncope. Here's a great example of vasovagal syncope. This is the 2004 National Spelling Bee. It's a high-pressure emotional situation. Participants are up on the stage under hot lights, and note how the student appears to feel prodrome for a few seconds before he actually faints. In addition to the prodrome, this also demonstrates the rapid recovery after syncope. A L O P E C O I. That is correct. The student actually finished second overall in this contest. Then there is situational syncope. In this subtype, the syncope frequently recurs during a common daily action, for example, coughing, sneezing, micturition, defecation, or immediately post exercise. Finally, as a separate subtype, is something called carotid hypersensitivity. In this disorder, the baroreceptors in the carotid sinus are too easily stimulated, resulting in excessive vagal input. This might manifest as a person who becomes severely bradycardic or even has a pronounced sinus pause in response to mild pressure applied to the neck 
such as with shaving. Among these, not only is vasal vagal syncope the most common within the group, but it's also the most common etiology of any type of syncope. In addition to clinical subtypes of reflex syncope, which are grouped based on trigger, there are three physiologic subtypes. When the primary abnormal physiologic response is inappropriate vasodilation, that's referred to as the vasodepressor subtype. If the primary abnormal response is bradycardia, that's referred to as the cardio inhibitor subtype. And if both vasodilation and bradycardia are prominent, that's referred to as mixed reflex syncope. The next large category of syncope is cardiogenic syncope. This includes any mechanism that arises predominantly from within the heart itself. As mentioned earlier, cardiogenic syncope is suggested on history by a complete lack of symptoms preceding the loss of consciousness, that is, there is no prodrome. This is not remotely an absolute rule, as there are plenty of patients with cardiogenic syncope who do experience a brief prodrome, particularly of lightheadedness. The prognosis for patients who have experienced cardiogenic syncope is generally worse than that for patients who have experienced other types. Specific etiologies of cardiogenic syncope include bradyarrhythmias, such as sinus bradycardia, sinus pauses, or AV block, tachyarrhythmias, such as ventricular tachycardia, while supraventricular tachycardias, such as AVNRT or rapid AFib, can cause on occasion syncope, they are much more likely to cause palpitations or lightheadedness without frank loss of consciousness. There is structural heart disease, specifically severe aortic stenosis and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And there are a few miscellaneous causes, most notably a massive pulmonary embolism. The final large category of syncope is orthostatic syncope. This occurs when the patient's blood pressure drops too much upon moving from the sitting or supine positions to standing. A positional drop in blood pressure without syncope is referred to as just orthostatic hypotension. To understand the causes of orthostatic syncope, I'll need to review the normal hemodynamic response to standing. There are three components, the heart, the arteries, and the brain. So when a patient stands, blood pools in the vessels of the legs and abdomen. This decreases preload, which decreases cardiac output, and thus blood pressure. The decreased blood pressure is sensed by baroreceptors, which send signals to the CNS, and the CNS's response is to increase sympathetic output and to decrease parasympathetic output. This combination results in a peripheral vasoconstriction, increased myocardial contractility, and increased heart rate, the net result of which is increased blood pressure. Any problem in that series of steps can lead to orthostasis. Its etiologies can be placed into four groups. Primary autonomic failure, meaning a disease of the nervous system, such as Parkinson's disease, which interferes with the CNS's response to baroreceptor input. Secondary autonomic failure, in which a systemic disease interferes with either the baroreceptors, the afferent or efferent components of the autonomic nervous system, or all of them. The most commonly implicated systemic diseases are diabetes and alcoholism. Volume depletion of any cause may result in a more pronounced drop in preload, which can't fully be compensated by vasoconstriction, increased contractility, and increased heart rate. And last, medications, including all antihypertensives, particularly alpha blockers, also used for prostatic hypertrophy, as well as most antidepressants and antipsychotics. Diagnosis of orthostatic hypotension is based upon a patient's blood pressure response when they move from the supine to sitting position and then from sitting to standing. Typically, when either of the following is measured within 2-5 to five minutes of moving from supine to standing, the patient is said to be orthostatic. A decrease in systolic blood pressure by 20 millimeters of mercury or a decrease in diastolic blood pressure by 10 millimeters of mercury. Some clinicians also consider the diagnosis to be present just if the patient reports lightheadedness upon standing, even if vitals remain steady.
Historically, an increase in the heart rate upon standing was also considered to be indicative of orthostasis, irrespective of what was happening with the blood pressure, but most people no longer consider this necessary nor sufficient for the diagnosis. In places where paper charts are still used instead of electronic medical records, these little stick figure diagrams are a common way to visually record a patient's vital response to an orthostatic challenge. The numbers next to the blood pressures are the heart rates for each position. Whenever syncope occurs in the presence of orthostatic hypotension, it's generally assumed to be due to the orthostasis, provided that an alternative explanation is not readily apparent from history, exam, and the ECG. This unique circular chart, for which I cannot claim credit, is a wonderful depiction of the underlying physiologic derangements in different types of syncope. In addition to all of the etiologies of syncope already mentioned, there are a couple of reasons a patient can lose consciousness which are not technically syncope. For example, vertebrobasilar insufficiency, caused by focal diminished blood flow in the posterior circulation, which supplies blood to the brainstem. This can be the result of atherosclerosis. A similar process is called subclavian steel syndrome, which is the consequence of a focal stenosis of the subclavian artery proximal to the takeoff of one of the vertebral arteries. Blood travels up the contralateral vertebral artery to the basilar artery, and because of the subclavian stenosis, the other vertebral artery has relatively low pressure. This creates a gradient between the two vertebral arteries, which leads to blood being shunted away from the basilar artery to travel retrograde down the opposite vertebral artery. This reduces blood delivery to the branches of the basilar. Seizure also causes a loss of consciousness that can mimic syncope, although the opposite is generally more common, in which a patient experiences syncope that is accompanied by some transient myoclonic jerks, which gets misinterpreted by layperson witnesses as a seizure. But let's briefly compare syncope and seizure. How can we distinguish them? First, the prodrome of syncope, when it occurs, consists of lightheadedness, bilateral visual loss, which is sometimes described as a shade being lowered on the vision, and less commonly nausea. On the other hand, seizures can also be preceded by unusual symptoms, but in this case there's frequently smells or tastes or other vague sensory inputs which are collectively called an aura rather than a prodrome. With syncope, if they are present, tonic-clonic movements typically start after the onset of loss of consciousness and last fewer than 15 seconds. With seizure, the movements start at the onset of loss of consciousness and last longer than 15 seconds. Lastly, with syncope, confusion after the event usually lasts seconds to no longer than a minute, while confusion after a seizure usually lasts several minutes and occasionally longer. Alcohol intoxication, specifically losses of consciousness known colloquially as alcoholic blackouts, can look and sound a lot like syncope. It's not uncommon for alcoholics to receive syncope workups for unwitnessed falls that were probably just due to heavy intoxication. There's a condition called cataplexy, in which a patient loses most or all of their postural tone in response to an emotional event. Unlike the other conditions on this list, when a patient experiences cataplexy, they remain conscious and aware of the event. Finally, there's a self-explanatory condition called psychogenic pseudosyncope, which isn't common, but can be very difficult to distinguish from true syncope. You should be aware that some references and clinicians consider the first two conditions on this list to actually be forms of syncope, which they refer to as cerebrovascular syncope or sometimes neurogenic syncope. Returning to causes of true syncope, in addition to differences in treatment, another important reason to distinguish between these causes is prognosis. This chart shows the overall survival of patients with syncope in comparison to those without syncope. As you can see, patients who experience cardiogenic syncope have a significantly worse overall survival as compared to those patients with other causes of syncope. And those with vasovagal syncope, which is grouped together in this graph with orthostatic syncope and syncope related to medication use, has survival outcomes identical to those without any syncope at all. So the main takeaway is that cardiogenic syncope is the one that suggests a dangerous underlying condition,
and so the evaluation of syncope is largely related to ruling out these cardiac causes, particularly arrhythmias. To help determine which patients presenting to the emergency room with syncope might have a cardiogenic cause and which patients are very unlikely to, several clinical prediction rules have been developed. One of the most widely known is the San Francisco syncope rule. With this rule, having any of the following features was predictive of adverse short-term outcomes and thus suggests the need for admission and inpatient workup. An abnormal ECG, in which abnormal is considered to be an arrhythmia, evidence of active ischemia, QT prolongation, or evidence of proarrhythmia syndromes, such as Brugada syndrome, Wolf-Parkinson-White, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, a history of heart failure, dyspnea upon ER presentation, a systolic blood pressure under 90, and although it isn't suggestive of a cardiogenic cause specifically, empiric evidence found a hematocrit under 30%, was also predictive of poor short-term outcomes. Another prediction rule is the Osservatorio Epidemiologico Sola Syncope del Lazio Risk Score. With this prediction model, any of the following suggested a high-risk patient. Abnormal ECG, age over 65, in absence of preceding symptoms, that is, there was no prodrome, and a history of cardiovascular disease. To see how good these prediction rules were at identifying high-risk patients, a paper was published in 2014 comparing them against clinical judgment. Here's what was found. In terms of specificity, clinical judgment and the risk scores all performed equally well at predicting which patients would have serious outcomes in the ED at 10 days post-presentation and at 30 days post-presentation. But in terms of sensitivity, clinical judgment outperformed both risk scores at the later two time points. So what's the bottom line with these prediction rules? They help to remind clinicians of important factors to consider when classifying a patient with syncope as being high versus low risk. However, they are not superior to clinical judgment. So if you're seeing a patient in the ED and something about the story, medical history, or objective data concerns you, you should not let these rules talk you out of admitting the patient. Whether or not a patient is admitted for syncope, the clinician will need to decide which diagnostic tests to order to determine the cause. Historically, that is when I was in medical school and residency, there was a specific collection of tests which were ordered on all patients presenting with syncope. Everyone got an ECG, head CT, echocardiogram, carotid ultrasound, and at least 24 hours of telemetry monitoring, irrespective of the concern for specific etiologies. And when I was in training, this always bothered me because some of these tests were literally never abnormal. So I was very excited to come across a paper from 2009 in the Archives of Internal Medicine, which was a retrospective analysis of the yield of diagnostic testing for all patients over the age of 65 who presented to an acute care hospital with syncope. The study looked at data from four and a half years and included over 2,000 syncope admissions. Here are some tests with the frequency with which they were ordered, the frequency with which they were abnormal, and the frequency with which they helped to determine the etiology of syncope. If one then looks at the cost of each test and divides the cost by the fraction of tests which helped to determine the etiology, one can establish a measure of cost effectiveness purely from a diagnostic point of view. At one end of the spectrum, orthostatic vital signs were helpful in determining the etiology of syncope in 15% of patients and are estimated to cost somewhere around $5, which is based on the length of time it takes a person to measure and record them. This means that it costs about $30 worth of checking orthostatics in a patient for each diagnosis made. That sounds like a very good deal. At the other end of the spectrum is a head CT. It helped to determine the etiology in just 0.5% of patients and was reported to cost $525, which to be honest seems much cheaper than I think is typical. But if we go with that number, this resulted in a diagnostic cost effectiveness of $100,000. This means that this particular hospital had to spend $100,000 on head CTs for each time one helped to make a diagnosis. And the actual utility of this is much less than it sounds, 
because this doesn't mean $100,000 per life saved or per quality adjusted life year or any other hard clinically relevant outcome. This is $100,000 just to make a diagnosis. That is a terrible, terrible deal. In summary, cost-effective tests for most patients include assessment of orthostatic blood pressure, an ECG, and either telemetry if the person is an inpatient or an ambulatory ECG monitor if an outpatient. Everything else, that is head CT, brain MRI, EEG, echocardiogram, carotid ultrasound, cardiac stress testing, and even cardiac enzymes, are not cost-effective tests in the absence of specific high-risk features or additional indications. So if the patient has an unexplained focal neurological deficit, or if they physically struck their head during syncope, then some type of neuroimaging is probably warranted. And if on exam, a patient has a loud systolic crescendo-decrescendo murmur radiating to the carotids, then yes, they should get an echo. But ordering all of these tests indiscriminately in everyone with syncope is not justifiable. I'll end by discussing a few additional diagnostic tests that may be indicated in very specific situations. Carotid sinus massage consists of firmly pressing on the carotid sinus in a circular motion for a few seconds while the patient is on a cardiac monitor. A typical indication for this is when you have a relatively older patient who is without an established etiology after routine initial tests, or if they report syncope in the setting of having pressure applied to their neck. Carotid sinus hypersensitivity is diagnosed if the patient experiences a sinus pause greater than 3 seconds, develops severe sinus bradycardia, or has a very prominent drop in blood pressure, which can be difficult to catch since it may last for shorter than the cycling of an automated blood pressure cuff. Tilt table testing consists of strapping a patient to a table that literally tilts to various degrees. It's performed on patients for whom reflex syncope is suspected, but not confirmed, and the specific protocol of how this is done is a little bit beyond the scope of this particular video. An electrophysiology study in which electrodes are introduced into various structures of the heart via the venous circulation is done in patients in whom the history is strongly consistent with an arrhythmia, but standard workup has failed to determine the specific rhythm. And last is an implantable loop recorder, which is a small device which acts as a continuous ECG monitor but one which is literally implanted beneath the skin as it's intended to be kept in place for months. This is done in patients who are experiencing recurrent syncope of unclear etiology despite the standard workup and in which the syncopal events are infrequent enough to not be caught on routine ambulatory ECG monitor. That concludes this video on syncope. In summary, here are the five major takeaway points. The four components of syncope are an abrupt loss of consciousness, loss of postural tone, short duration, and spontaneous recovery. There are many causes of syncope, but they fall into three major categories, reflex, cardiogenic, and orthostatic. Cardiogenic syncope carries the worst prognosis. When deciding whether to admit a patient from the ED with syncope, clinical prediction rules should not trump clinical judgment. And finally, some tests which are ordered to evaluate syncope, including carotid ultrasounds, echocardiograms, and neuroimaging, are not universally cost-effective and should only be ordered if there are additional specific indications. <laughs>